Next, let's discuss some basic program design principles before we dig into designing planning and training programs for our beginner, intermediate, and advanced clients. So let's start with tempo. So first, I wanna start off with saying that there's no such thing as doing tempo training. Um, you kinda of hear sometimes, do you utilize, the question, do you utilize tempo, tempo in your training or do you focus on tempo in your training? No matter what we do in the gym, tempo is involved. So the real question is, do you pay attention to tempo in your training or, and do you control for tempo in your training? And the answer to that should be absolutely yes, no matter what the intention is, tempo is always a part of the equation. So tempo represented by four numbers is, the first number is the eccentric phase of the movement. The second number is the pause at the bottom of the movement. The third number is the speed of the concentric or coming up in the movement. And then finally, the fourth number is the pause at the top of the movement. In movements like the deadlift or the pull-up, this is kind of flipped upside down because when you start the movement, you're actually not starting on the first number. You're starting on the third number because you're pulling yourself up and that's a concentric or you're pulling the barbell off the ground, that's a concentric. So keep that in mind when designing pull-ups and deadlifts, for example. So now when we look at tempo and how it connects to the beginner, intermediate, and advanced, I just wanna throw out some themes and some things that I want you to think about when designing training programs for these avatars. So first, the beginner. We wanna think about slow, controlled, and utilizing pauses. So when we start thinking about those four numbers and, and how we design those in a training program, Think about what the intention is. If the intention is to learn a movement pattern, you should intuitively understand that you wanna learn that very slowly. You wanna own positions. You can probably utilize some pauses to ensure that you're keeping your client honest and owning those positions. You don't wanna see something like a 1-1-X-1 one, one, one when talking about learning a back squat because you can kind of just imagine what that would look like in practice. So think about slow and controlled. And then we'll talk about how that relates to the repetitions that you choose for that client. Next, think about the intermediate. The eccentrics get a little bit faster, right? They learned how to do that movement. And uh, principally, uh, we learn movements through the elongation of musculature. So when we go down in a movement, the musculature does this, it elongates. When that elongation happens, that's where learning occurs. So in motor control, for a beginner, it makes sense to make eccentrics very slow, very controlled. When motor control is gained, we can now afford to go a little bit faster in those eccentrics. We now look at exploding in concentrics. So if someone's learning to do a movement, you probably don't want to put that explosive intent in their brain because they're not owning the movement. They're not controlling the movement through the concentric. So although they're not, they're, typically they're not doing four seconds in the concentric, like they are doing four seconds in the eccentric, you still want to put it in their brains. I want you to own the concentric. I want you to own the movement. So if you say, I want you to explode every single time that you come up out of that back squat, they might lose some positions because they haven't learned that pattern quite yet. Next, the intermediate, we can start looking at eliciting a metabolic response with this client. So what does that mean? That means that the rep range might look very similar. The time under tension might look very similar as the beginner client, but now the goal is to challenge that motor control. As we challenge motor control, or better yet, as we challenge the positions that we learned in motor control, we can start to push time to the right a little bit. We can push fatigue to the right a little bit. We can do sets of 20, sets of 25s. Although the movement looks great, we're now creating a metabolic response, and that's appropriate for that intermediate client, or it's appropriate to start that with an intermediate client. And finally, with an advanced client, this is just very based on the intention. So you can have an advanced client where you're taking a step back and you're um, trying to elicit some further learning in patterns where you're like, I want you to do paused back squats because I want you to own the bottom position of the back squat. That's okay. So we can utilize motor control principles or beginner principles with advanced clients. We can do strength endurance work with advanced clients. And we can do max contraction work with advanced clients. So how does that relate to tempo? If we're doing max contractions, the goal is to elicit maximal expression. So we're just saying control and explode. So typically that looks something like a 2-0-X-1, right? We're controlling on the way down, but not so slow 
where we're elongating the musculature to a point of fatigue, but we're controlling enough where we can own that bottom position. We're exploding out of the bottom of that back squat and we can do a heavy triple, double, or even single. So with the advanced client, it just varies in, in terms of how you want to prescribe tempo based on the intention of the training program. Next, we put tempo, sets, reps, and rest all together. So before we dig into this, let's just look at how we at OPEX design resistance training programs. So just imagine this is like an A, right? So for A, we have front squat, which is the exercise, comma, at 20x1, which is the tempo, comma, six reps, comma, four sets, semicolon, rest, two minutes. So that's how a resistance program is written here at OPEX. Now when we talk about the variations inside of this and how these things relate, we look at those four things. We look at the tempo, the sets, the reps, and the rest. It's very important that we keep all four of those variables in mind because that strongly dictates, dictates what dose response our clients get along with the intensity that's used on the bar and the front squat. So first, let's talk about the inverse relationship that reps and sets have. Principally, when you have high reps, you have lower sets. So if, if I wanted to do 12 reps on the front squat, I'm not doing times 10 sets. I know there's programs out there where they push high, high volume, right? Like German volume and stuff like that. We're not talking about that here. Those are for like the 0.001 percenters that need to eke out whatever they're getting out of that training program. But principally, if we have 12 reps, I'm gonna do probably two, three, kind of pushing it with four sets. If I have a medium amount of reps, I'm gonna have a medium amount of sets. So typical five by five, right? If I have low reps, I'm typically going to have higher amounts of sets. So if I'm doing singles, I can do six, eight, 10 sets of singles. You can kind of see how there's that inverse relationship between those two numbers. Next, let's talk about time under tension. And we kind of hit it here in the tempo piece, but we have to really think about how we utilize time under tension and what it means. Time under tension is simply taking the total amount of time in the tempo, so per repetition, and you're multiplying it by the number of reps, right? So you multiply tempo by reps, and that's how many seconds each set is. So that's your time under tension per set. This gets a little bit confusing for some coaches because you could have two training programs that have the exact same time under tension with completely different intentions. Think about this, a four, zero, four, zero tempo times six reps, right? Think about the total time under tension there. Now compare that to a 2, 1, X, 1 times 12 reps. The time under tension is very similar, but the intention is clearly different. In the 4, 0, 4, 0, the goal is to control the eccentric, control the concentric. So you can kind of just imagine the amount of load that's going to be on the bar in the front squat with that tempo. Now if we do the 2, 0, X, 1 times 12 reps, you can kind of see the difference in the loading on the bar and how the intent is completely different, although the time under tensions are very, very similar. One, the 4040, is to gain motor control in the front squat or the squat pattern. The 20x1 times 12, that's probably pushing on some strength endurance. We're probably starting to elicit some metabolic fatigue. So really think about time under tension and think about the reps and the sets that you utilize for each one of those exercises and understand the intentions behind that before you just blindly say 40 seconds of time under tension is 40 seconds of time under tension because that is not always the case. Finally, with rest, I just put a note here, do not ignore rest. So rest is extremely important in terms of the intention of the exercise. So think about the 4040, let's say six reps times four sets, and you rest 15 seconds versus four minutes. Think about the fatigue that's going to accumulate with 15 seconds of rest between each one of those sets, if they're just straight sets, it's just an A, right? You can kind of imagine how painful that's going to be. And if the goal is to learn the squat pattern, you're setting your client up for failure. If the goal is to learn, increase rest times. Every time your client goes under that barbell or goes under that dumbbell, you want to ensure that they're as fresh as possible to learn and own that movement pattern. 
If the goal is to elicit some metabolic fatigue, if the goal is to challenge positions and strength endurance, I can kind of get on board with some lower rest, some 15 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe even 60 seconds of rest. So really think about and do not ignore rest periods with your clients.